All right, it's time, it's time, it's time, time, time. Time is the theme of the week. We're getting into developmental psychology, the entire field of developmental psychology, actually, in hopefully under two hours. We'll see how far we can get into it. So uh, what are we going to be talking about today? Well, we're talking about development, get it, development, of the body, the mind, and the personality. So probably that's going to be how things are going to get taken care of. We're going to define some terms. We're going to chat about a couple of things on the top end and then move into biological development in terms of like motor skills and reflexes and how that all works over time. We're going to get into the development of the mind. We're going to get into things like theories of cognitive development in particular, um, stuff like object permanence, which is going to have a lot of, it's always fun to show the videos for that one. And then getting into personality. We're going to talk about attachment styles, and a bunch of other really kind of fun stuff, uh, gender, sexuality, attachment styles, things that are more in the, the personality domain, hence why it's under personalities. All right, so what is developmental psychology? It is a whole heckin' lot, because it turns out that if you take any concept in psychology and you add time and you study it across lifetime, it is now in the purview of developmental psych. It's just kind of how it works. And so as a academic, I principally studied social cognition. So I looked at how people make sense of social situations and how they interact with them and how they influence how they influence situations and how situations influence them. Particularly, I looked at how people might be inclined to become less racist, sexist, homophobic, transphobic, etc. So I did a lot of sort of social cognitive interventions. But if I did that, and I looked at that over lifetime and said, I'm interested in how people become, what factors in, it would be useful in predicting whether or not someone becomes you know, less homophobic, transphobic, what have you, over the course of their lifetime. Well, then I'm a developmental psychologist and not a social psychologist anymore. And this opens up a lot of unique challenges, such as the nature of time itself. And... Consequently, the post hoc fallacy, also known as issues of cause and effect. If you're looking for unique changes over time, ideally the gold standard, if you're trying to be an academic psychologist, is that you want to be able to establish causation. But you have so many correlations to work with, and you have all this stuff happening over the course of a person's lifespan, that it can be easy to assume that certain things are causing each other when that is just not the case. You know, in the past, we've talked about um ice cream and violent crime correlation there doesn't necessarily equal causation did you know that the number of serial killers is correlated with the amount of milk consumed it's like per capita also true but not necessarily in a causal way it's just a very weird quirk because in the aggregate of all things it's very easy to find very strange correlations and sometimes very funny to call them causal and also if you're looking at this kind of stuff you have the complication that, let's say, for example, you're interested in early childhood development. That's a big, big area of study in developmental psychology. However, it's not just a matter, it's not really like, it's very hard to pin down individual factors. So, for example, in early developmental work, you might also have to be able to look at well, what's happening with the parents as well? And this is how you get into what we call cohort or matched pairs designs, where you have to say, all right, well, we want to look at how the child changes, but we have to find some way to account for or control for differences in parenting style, because the way the child is behaving might change the way the parent is behaving, which might change the way the child is behaving, and it becomes very messy very quickly. So we try to do developmental work via change over time designs. The easiest of which is a cross-sectional design where you sample different people of different ages at different points in time. And this allows you to look at stuff like cohort effects. So let's say you take everyone who's between you know, 10 to 20, 20 to 30, 30 to 40, and you sample them all at one single time point. Like for example, um, today, December 26th in the year of our Lord and Savior, Luigi Mario, you run a big survey and you survey everybody, and that way you can look at the difference effect, the different effect of age. Because there is a real issue here in that if you can't, you try to make the assumption that a 30-year-old in 1970 
is going to be the same as a 30 year old in 2020, it's just not going to happen because there's so many other what we call cohort effects or effects that are bounded to a particular time. And these don't even happen over generations. They can happen over from year to year, month to month. I mean, for example, let's, let's just bring this back in. Back in the day, you know, within the last 10 years, groups like AKB48 were, were the hot, the hot, hot, hot as shit in the world of idols. And then it became 2.5D idols with groups like Muse and Aqua and the Idol Master and Love High School Idol Project. And now we live in this bizarre world of virtual YouTuber anti-idols. Like, this is all within the last, what, five to ten years. And these are massively different changes. So if you were a person that was interested in maybe how people consume media, and maybe patterns of media consumption over the course of time, cohort effects are going to be a huge factor there because they change so much, even from the course of year to year, or even in the spans of several months. <sighs> So how do we deal with stuff like this? Well, one way is to do multiple measurements. So you might say, well, let's track people over time. Let's focus on a group of people. Let's take survey samples and say we study a thousand people at the age uh, when they are at the age of 10. And then we track them and give them a survey every year for the next 10 years of their lives. And we can then look at these huge cohort studies and then track certain developmental factors that way. So instead of trying to say, like we would do in my work, where we're not really as concerned in time, try to get a bunch of different people at one particular slice, you might get a smaller group of people, but survey them over a much broader span of time. This is also what we would call multi-level modeling or the good kind of MLM, which might be a subject for a, maybe a bonus lecture at some point. It's a very in-demand area of, com of computation at the moment. And it's also something that I happen to be kind of an expert in. I've published many multi-level modeling papers. And what it looks like over time is basically saying, look, we can't assume that the relationship is between, let's say, diet score and BMI is the same for everyone. And so we assume that our data is nested or you have groups or subgroups within that, in the group within your population or the sample that you have measured. And then by going back and accounting for those differences, you're able to actually look at maybe the effect of a cohort or the effect of age and see how the effect or relationship between two variables might differ over time. This kind of stuff is hugely important in developmental work because it's so important to see how time varies between groups, because oftentimes that's the big developmental question. If you're interested in childhood anxiety, you might want to look and say, okay, well, how does that relationship between time as the per child ages and overall anxiety differ based on parenting style? Maybe the person has more permissive versus more authoritarian parents. Maybe it's, if you're really interested in it because there's grant money in it, Maybe you're interested in violent video games and you want to see whether or not there's a difference in the effect of gender. So you have violent video game usage and gender and you want to look at that over time. Multi-level modeling is how you handle it. Hmm. Take, a, take a sippy there. Let's get into this. All right. So the big question, um, when it comes to developmental psychology, are we predominantly interested in nature or nurture? The answer is kind of both. It turns out that as we're going to touch on this lecture and also more broadly and basically everything I've done for this course, we have tried, or at least I've tried to break down this idea that there are hard dichotomies in psychology. They just don't work. They don't add up. They're very convenient. But if anyone is promising you a short, concise, yes, no, black and white worldview when it comes to psychology, just walk away, hit the bricks. You don't have to stick around because all these things are tremendously muddy and complicated and difficult to really break down. So when someone says, hey, nature or nurture, it's one or the other, just don't listen to them. They don't know what they're talking about. Listen to me, the, the VTuber. <laughs> I know what I'm saying. So when it comes to stuff like gene environment interaction, we have things like we have maybe certain cases where we have a child with certain genetic sequences that may only become 
prevalent or might be activated if they are in a particular environment. Meaning we would, that there is, has to be a nature via nurture interaction. If they aren't exposed to certain factors, then those different genetic traits are not going to activate. So it, for example, you might have, let's say, a gene that might make you particularly disposed to developing an anxiety disorder later on, but that's only if you have, let's say, a particular childhood trauma, or you have a particular, a particular anxiety, a elevated level of anxiety as, an, as a child, and that might lead to a chronic anxiety disorder later on. But if the person has a consistent or dependable childhood, they might never develop that anxiety disorder, despite the fact that they have the gene that could predispose them to it. You know, again, these things are very muddy. And so even if you look at somebody and they say, well, you have a gene that is going to be that makes you especially vulnerable to developing skin cancer, for example, well, you still probably won't develop skin cancer if you aren't out in the sun. There needs to be more than just the genetic factor. There must have there also have to be environmental factors present. And now is the part where I teach you where babies come from, because now we're going to segue into physical development. And then again, we're going to talk about then cognitive development and get into finally personality development over time. So where do babies come from? First, a sperm fertilizes an egg, creating a zygote. Then the zygote, a single cell, divides repeatedly forming a blastocyst, which is a bundle of cells. After two weeks, the blastocyst will continue to divide and become an embryo. And around the ninth week, that blastocyst becomes, or that embryo becomes a fetus. Their major organs have developed, and until the, after that point, the fetus basically just bulks up until they're born. Yeah. So here, here it is. I finally, I finally talked about talked about sex on stream. So um, if anyone ever asks you where do babies come from, now you know, and you can tell them that I told you. So that's that's all cool, right? You know, we're talking about we're talking about babies and, and zygotes and blastocysts. Let's talk about the brain, because the brain is what we're really here for, right? Because brains are silly and fun to talk about. So the brain development begins about 18 days after fertilization. And until about the six month mark, neurons are rapidly expanding. Up to this is this blows my mind whenever I look at this figure. There are a quarter of a million neurons generated in a fetus every minute. Think about that. Think about that for a second. Like in four minutes, in the amount of time it will take me to go over this slide, a fetus will have generated a million new neurons. Like, wow, brains are fucking weird. And then around the four month mark, at that point, the neurons start to organize and develop specific brain structures. So there's a massive proliferation, an explosion of neural development. You get a whole bunch of neurons and then they got to figure out where to go and they sort into the structures that we've talked about. The frontal lobe, the prenatal lobe, the the brain stem and all that and all that. So at first, there's just a massive proliferation of neurons and then the neurons are activated. Interestingly enough, when we think about obstacles to development in the prenatal environment, they're basically only negative. It's like, despite all the pop psych about like listening to Beethoven while you're pregnant and everything, it doesn't really have a conclusive effect. And yet, a wild amount of stuff it can just go wrong during the prenatal point. So obviously smoking, drugs, if, a, if the person carrying the child gets chicken pox, it can cause tremendous trauma to the fetus. Um, fetal alcohol syndrome, it's in the name, for example. It's like drinking especially can cause a lot of issues with a child. Now, genetic disorders can also develop at this period, and those can be a combination of either inherited disorders or just random errors in cell division. Think about it. If all those cells are being generated every minute, sometimes things just go wrong. So, for example, having a third copy of chromosome 21 of the chromosomes that we have as human beings it has been connected to the development of Down syndrome symptoms. And then even once prenatal development is more or less done and premature birth is still a factor. And so being born prior to 36 weeks with a 37 to 42 week 
window being typically normal for delivering a child, the less time the, the child spends in utero, there's the greater chance of serious complications. So it turns out that fetuses have a tremendous amount of development, and then things keep being kind of wacky as we develop into sort of into infancy and then into, into our adolescence and ultimately into our adulthood. So motor development is one of the most interesting things when it comes to the first couple of years of a child's life. It turns out that we are actually born with an extensive set of automatic behaviors that we call reflexes. So let's, let's take a look at some of these. Whoop. And we're over. And wait, wait. How can I can I can I stick the landing? Yes, I can. Uh, play Dungeon Munchies. It's it's a great song, and also it's a great game with great music that's excellent for background music. So you might be familiar with a couple of these already. So one of which is the rooting reflex. So it turns out that from the moment we are born, if you touch a baby's cheek, they will turn to face wherever they are touched, and usually start sucking. It's a feeding reflex. It's not something that requires any level of special, I love how this is in slow motion now, in case you missed it before, but you don't need to really think about this at all. There's no real cognitive trajectory or cognitive mechanisms that are at play here. It's a thing that we all do, and we all know how to do from the moment of birth. It's just a reflex we have. In fact, we have a fair number of them. Surprisingly, did you know that babies know how to swim from the moment they are born? Which means that there are plenty of funny vid great videos of people tossing babies into pools to see what happens. <laughs> I love this one. They just, just, just chuck them in there. Just toss them in. Babies know how to swim from the moment they're born. You can just throw them in the pool. <laughs> and what they'll do is roll to their back and then start paddling. No, babies just know how to swim. <laughs> Baby. <laughs> See? From the moment they're born, babies can just do this. They're not good swimmers, but neither am I. Seven seconds under. You can just toss them in the pool and they know how to get the Yeah, just just a little bit of lifelong trauma. Just a little bit of lifelong trauma for YouTube. How about that? Here's another one. Aw, oh, good baby. Good baby. Let's go back and see and, and see the chucking again. <laughs> just just tossing <laughs> she just tosses the baby! If you can't tell, I really love these videos. I know, I can't, like, <laughs> being upstaged by a literal baby. Yeah, the SpongeBob avatar is good. Hey, just eat the child, they'll be fine. I hope. All right. I mean, that's fascinating, right? Like, you can literally just toss a baby into a pool, and from the moment they're born, they will be able to get to the surface, roll onto their back, and start paddling to stay buoyant. Like, how about that? Babies are wild. Way more impressive than me sometimes. Now, the thing is, we consider these to be reflexes. And then, as we develop, we go into what we call motor behaviors, which are self-initiated body movements. They require coordination of movement, of muscles, of bones, of balance, and all that. So these are things that we wouldn't really consider motor behaviors because they're just things that babies do. And gradually, we lose some of these reflexes over time. Right now, you can't see it, but I'm touching my own cheek, and I'm able to avoid moving toward it because I know that it's not a nipple. Now, what do these stages look like? When it comes to how babies develop, they tend to start with being able to sit without support at about six months. That leads into crawling at nine months, standing at about a year, cruising a little bit after that. No, it's not that kind of cruising. That happens later walking without assistance at 13 months, and 
able to actually straight up run as this very excited child looks. <laughs> These babies look terrified. Look, children in psychology textbooks always look terrified. I, I can't. I, it's almost like maybe kids aren't always super happy to be taking uh, taking part in studies. But usually, at about the two year mark, kids are able to run. So there is a wide range in the rate in the manner of achieving motor milestones, but but turns out that these can be like that we tend to hit them in the same order and they can be influenced by physical maturity cultural or parenting practices so if someone is really encouraging their kid to walk and really working on developing the muscles and coordination skills that a child needs maybe they'll hit walking or running earlier than another child but generally these are the skill like the same goal posts have to be hit in order for a child to be able to get to that point where they can run and then we get into stuff like adolescence. So childhood, basically, we go through the first couple of years of life. Adolescence, as we roughly hit our teenage years, and then we get into the third phase of adulthood. So really, there's sort of a, a four-step design in a lot of developmental psych. We have sort of infancy into childhood, into adolescence, into adulthood. Although, interestingly, more recent work based on a number of factors, most the least of which are capitalism, we're starting to see a shift where papers are talking about a five-stage model where we have a young adulthood, which might extend from your 20s to your 30s, where you're crushed by student debt and unable and <laughs> stuck in a rental trap. And maybe you try to become a content creator. You know, that happens, too. So one of the developmental <laughs> milestones of young adulthood, you become a VTuber, I guess. How about that? So during this time, our bodies mature. Um, as we hit puberty, estrogens and androgens are produced by the body, just in different levels between people, like based on the dynamics of what chromosomes they have and kind of what box they might biologically be in. But again, even between people that are sort of assigned male at birth or assigned female at birth, there's a large amount of variation in the degrees and the amounts of estrogens and androgens that are created. And so just like I said before, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, a lot of these hard dichotomies, like having what you have, especially when it comes to gender, they're not real. Trust me, I'm a doctor. But in general, for most people, puberty also leads to the ability to reproduce and what the dynamics of puberty, again, are influenced predominantly by genetic and environmental factors. It's basically true of anything we're talking about in, in developmental psych. So what does it mean to move into adulthood then? Well, most people peak in their early 20s, which is why I tell everyone that I'm 24 and not a day older. And usually that means that after about our early 20s, we start to see a, a gradual decline in strength, coordination, speed, cognitive ability, physical flexibility, whether or not my, my back hurts in the morning, and so on and so forth. Let's see, I have a, we have one question here. Yeah, yeah, no problem. I know I don't have the chat up, but I like taking questions. So the question is, do estrogens and androgens matter when it comes to upper body growth or just protein in one's diet? Well, it depends. So... The effect of testosterone on muscle development in particular is over is overestimated. There is an effect of testosterone that is true, but it's it's not like uh, it causes people to hulk out. So there is an implication. So people, especially when it comes to testosterone, but also estrogen, they get brought up as like these massively important hormones for every facet of our bodies. But kind of like I was saying, everyone produces both of them just in different amounts. So it's kind of one of those things where they do, but there's also a lot of other factors. So especially when it comes to stuff like upper body growth, protein and diet and physical activity are also going to matter a lot. I hope that answers your question. But yeah, if you ever like, I, I, um, I know like I said, I don't have the chat up, but if you ever have questions, and I usually put this up on YouTube afterwards for folks, but if you're ever catching this live and you have a question for me, just uh, either like, asking me live or like shoot it in a comment or a question or something. I love talking to people about this stuff. I wouldn't be doing this in my spare time if I didn't like talking about this. <laughs> anyway, so, uh, oh no, my gag, no, my joke. So yeah, um, it turns out that time makes us old, but so do beaches. 
get it. It's it's topical. There is an M Night Shyamalan movie, right? Anyway, moving on. <laughs> so, all right, that wraps up body development. Um. We're going to be pivoting a little bit, getting into cognitive development. This is the one where you get to watch the real fun videos. So I know I, I said that we're going to watch uh, some fun stuff tonight, but this is where it really happens. If you thought that the babies getting thrown into pools was great, just wait. So how do we explain cognitive development? It's hard. And there have been many attempts to explain how people <laughs> acquire abilities to learn, to think, to communicate, and remember. Uh, we've talked about many of them. We've talked about language. We've talked about cognition. We've talked about memory in particular already in this course. It turns out when you add time, those were already complicated, and then you add time. And that's really the, the, the core complication when it comes down to developmental psychology is you're taking these things that are already very nuanced, have a lot of room for gray area. Ooh, I burped. Have a lot of room for gray area, and yet you make it even more complicated by adding time. And yet, many people have tried. So, how do these tend to differ? Well, the these general theories of cognitive development tend to fall into a couple of different categories. They either look at stages of development or continuous development. And they either look at having sort of domain general, which where we sort of develop all of our skills in tandem, or domain specific accounts, where we look at specific windows for, for specific skills. They also differ in where we get our information from. Some theories would say that we have a biological focus and emphasis on our learning, that we sort of are prepared at certain junctions to acquire certain skills. Remember, we talked about critical junctions for language acquisition, and that there are some theorists who believe that we have sort of a window before puberty where it is very easy to learn additional languages, and then it gets harder afterwards. Some people would say that no, it's our physical experience that's our predominant source of learning, and then others would say it's social interaction. So you have a bunch of different categories, but in general, most theories of learning are going to fall into one of them. Piaget, who we talked about earlier when we went over intelligence, was also a major figure in contributing to theories of cognitive development and how people learn and acquire skills over time. So let's go over some goofy videos, right? Whoa, whoa, here we go. All right, so we're back. We're here. What would Piaget say about some of these things? Piaget has some interesting theories about cognitive development. Let's turn on closed captions. Let's get some audio. Let's go. Can you look at these two glasses? Do you think that they have the same amount of juice? Mm -hmm. You think they have the same? Okay. Yeah. Now we're going to pour this juice into this glass. Oh yeah, I love this part. I love this part. It's obviously the one on the right. Now, do you think that this glass has more juice? This glass has more juice? Or do you think that they have the same amount? That one has more. This one has so more. So smart. How do you think that this one has more? She gets it. It's taller. Mm-hmm. Okay, you ready? I fucking love this one. Does this row have more quarters? Does this row have more quarters? Or do they have the same? They're the same. One, two, three, three. <clears throat> Yeah, counting smart. They look the same. They're the same? Five, five. Okay. Shit rules. Okay. Does this row have more quarters? Does this row have more or do they have the same? This one has more. That one has more quarters? <laughs> Why does this row have more quarters? Big money! More far away. <laughs> big money! <laughs> big money! More far away. <laughs> if you spread it out, it's more! <laughs> Alright, we're gonna play a game with the graham crackers and we're gonna share them between me and you, okay? Okay. Do you think that we shared those fairly? 
No, why not? I share. You have done good for this. Well, what about why? What if we try this? This. Yeah. <laughs> I love kids. This is like, this is. <laughs> See, this is why you need to unionize your workplace. <laughs> All right, let's uh, let's get to the next one as well. Here's another fun example: egocentrism. Yeah, this is the thing. It's like doing this stuff to kids is basically is like ah, got them, but professionally. And that's the essence of developmental psychology. All right, let's 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 talk about kids and egocentrism for a second. What you see when you look at that from where you're sitting? What are some of the things that you see? Um, a cat. A cat. And a tree and a bone. Okay, now we're going to do the same thing. Can you tell me what you see when you look at it from that stool? Um, an owl. An owl? And a hen. What, what's, what is that? Uh, a goat. A goat? Yeah. Okay, Obviously a deer. Is there anything else you see? Yeah, right there. I was asked to model right for this what one. What is that? Uh, a tree. A tree. Another little tree. Yeah, right. okay. And can you tell me what I see when I look at this from where I'm sitting right here? An owl. Okay. And a goat. Mm -hmm. And a little tree. And that. And that. Okay, so can you tell me what you see from that side? A fox and a bone and a volcano and yeah. a rock and a big fat. Christmas tree. Oh. Now, Braxton, can you tell me what I see from what where What a precious I'm child. A bird and a river and a volcano and a horse and a rock and a plant. So in this clip, what we have is a young child and a slightly older child demonstrating egocentrism. In the first case, this kid still, despite the fact, let me make myself disappear. That's important for this. This child still, like, only they can see the things on the other side of the volcano, but they assume that the person running the study also can see them because they can't visually or mentally process the idea that other people have a different experience than them. Whereas the slightly older kid is able to process that and understand that other, they, they, other people see things differently. How about that? And so, it's time, though, and we return. Hello, <laughs> I hope you're doing well. All right, let's, uh, let's get into this display capture. Whoa, here we go. Okay, so we talked about... Are right, a couple of different tasks here. Remember, big money equals more money. Fall water equals more water. And if you break a graham cracker in half, you can swindle children. That's the lesson of today's <laughs> point. You can swindle children and cryptocurrency bros. We talked about egocentrism there. So the point here with Piaget and the major contribution of Piaget's thinking is that children are not little adults. That was basically how people thought about kids for the longest time, that kids basically see the world like adults do. But unfortunately, it's not the case. But fortunately, it's very funny. <laughs> So what does Piaget try to do? Recognizing that children are not just little adults and tend to make these same form of errors pretty consistently, Piaget decides to generate the first complete account of com cognitive development that's still influential today. So what does it mean? This is a stage theory and it is domain general. So there are discrete stages 
categories that people are going to fall into. And it is domain general in the say that we can develop all of our skills simultaneously around the same time. But is, is there an endpoint of cognitive development? In this model, Piaget sees the final skill, the end of the tech tree, being our ability to reason logically about hypotheticals. So that where we can actually logically deduce and process information that doesn't necessarily have to be there in the first place. So in PhD's model, we learn for two, from two predominant skills, assimilation, where we pull information in from the world, and eventually though, we're going to find exceptions, things that don't fit within our understanding of how the world works, and so we use accommodation to modify our understanding of the world and update the way that we think about things. So in general, in this case, we have a kid and the kid is like, well, when I walk, the ground is flat. But then eventually they start to realize that maybe hills and stuff exist and that the world isn't totally flat. And gradually with this challenge, they start to reason that the earth is actually round. So we have this initial assumption my neighborhood, the block that I live on is flat, is challenged by the existence of hills, which leads to the acceptance that maybe the world isn't totally flat. And these two tools are basically how Piaget thinks that we've learned literally everything about the world. And in general, people are going to go through four individual stages of development, each with their own limitations. So in the first stage, the sensory motor stage from birth to about two years, there is a focus on the here and now. Remember, the end point of Piaget's model is our ability to reason hypothetically. So how do we build things up? We focus on the here and now at first, and this is characterized by finally my favorite set of videos, object permanence. For children before the age of about two, if an object ceases to exist, it literally or it, to, it ceases to exist in front of them. It ceases to exist entirely. In other words, if it's not existing here in the here and now, it literally does not exist. And so now my career is over. But most of you are probably over two years old, so you understand that I just, yeah, you, you get the joke. Anyway, let's, let's watch some babies laugh. <laughs> And we're back. Whoa, and here we go. All right. So, why is peekaboo fun? You ever thought about that? Like, why do babies have so much fun playing this game? Because when you cover your face, they literally think that you have disappeared. They cannot process the idea that you are literally right there. And you don't even have to disappear. You can just put your hands in front of your face. And as far as the baby is concerned, you do not, you don't exist anymore. And then they're just happy to see you. How great is that? Look at these kids. Just happy little kids. Oh. oh no, I think I might like, I, I think I might win. <laughs> They're so happy. Oh, look at the, the drool. Okay, I just went on a journey where I was like, maybe I want kids. No, no, then it zoomed in on the drool. No, I don't want kids anymore. I'm done. <laughs> I'm done with this. Uh, all right. Who's ready to watch a seventh month old fail object permanence? <laughs> yeah, damn it. Kids kids not only get to be get to swim, but they get to be happy too. Is that your yummy giraffe? Love old recordings with, with audio interference. Where'd he go? Aha! <laughs> there it is! What did you do with it? Where did it go? 
Where did it go? It's right here! Oh! <laughs> it's the child! <laughs> this kid's eyes! <laughs> I don't know. Where'd it go? Where'd it go? <laughs> what? Why did you do this, you foul witch? Why have you hidden my toy? What do you have there? This is the part where I just start watching cute baby videos. Is that your yummy giraffe? Why would you take away the yummy giraffe? Where'd it go? Where'd it go? Where'd it go? Where'd he go? Ah! Where'd he go? There it is. Oh. I love this kid's expressions. This kid would make a hell of a VTuber. Where's that giraffe? Get this child alive too. <laughs> This kid would be more popular than me in like three weeks. Yeah, that's like the that's true. Like as far as this child is concerned, there were three different giraffes in that video. Can you imagine? Oh my God, there's this is great. I love going through PJ. You know, yeah, yeah. There's there's N Walker in my recommendations. What do you want? Yeah, this <laughs> get ready for you've seen it all before, but get ready for Hollow Babies. Sanji! Oh my god. Alright, I need, I need to move on before I, I get too into the idea of the Muppet Babies, but they're all VTubers. I'm surprised that hasn't happened yet, let's be real. Alright, and we're back in the classroom. So we've got all the major mi- like, So the first major milestone that we reach to get over the sens sensory motor stage, or sensor motory stage, is basically just the ability to develop mental representations and move beyond the here and now as the be all end all of existence. We then move into the pre operational stage, which is marked by our ability to use and construct mental representations of our experience. But it is hampered by egocentrism. Remember the kid with the volcano? He was able to imagine what a person might be able to see, but couldn't imagine outside of his own ability to perceive or his own knowledge of what was happening around the volcano. So he would, so they sit him down and you can see a couple of different things behind the volcano, you know, the fox and the bone and everything. And then when he moves to the other side, when they ask him, all right, well, you know, what can you like, what do you, and they switch seats, what do you think I can see? Well, he assumes the other person can see the same things that he can see. He has mental representations based on his own experience, but just assumes that everyone shares the experience and perspective that he does. So because of this, children between the ages of two to seven cannot perform mental operations. They can picture a vase that isn't there, but they can't picture the idea of what would happen if it was rotated. So all of those, if you've, we talked about intelligence tests, remember how there's a lot of emphasis on rotating different objects. This is why, because Piaget had a big impact on intelligence testing, which is initially designed to just gauge where a child was in these stages of development, which is why you get a bunch of rotational tasks, because Piaget thought of that as sort of the big skill that kids should be able to develop between the ages of two and seven the ability to mentally rotate objects and imagine hypotheticals with them. However, kids at this stage, as a consequence, again, lack conservation skills, which is why when you spread the pennies out, when you break a pretzel or a cracker in half, or you pour liquid between containers, they can't understand that it's still the same thing. If I break that graham cracker in half and then say, now you have two crackers, they're like, well, you are right. I do, in fact, have two crackers, and this seems like a very fair deal. That's just the nature of how kids are at that age. But then they get to the age of about 7 to 11, where they start to be able to perform those kinds of operations. And then from the age of 11 on, they start to be able to do more hypothetical reasoning using stuff like logic and reason. And that's at the point where they start to be able to own people on YouTube. So it's uh, around the age of 11 to adulthood, kids are able to use the YouTube comment sections to own me with facts and logic. 
So what's the issue with Piaget's theory? We still use it a lot. I mean, Piaget in particular, his theories of development are connected to his theories of intelligence. And Piaget has had an enormous impact on how we think about intelligence quotients and IQ and all that. For better or worse, really. So pros are that it's convenient. It's easy to explain. It's discreet. There's continuous stages. There's key milestones to meet. All that stuff just kind of makes sense. Now, the problem is... Well, it doesn't really work out this way in practice, right? Nothing is ever really that consistent. Oh no, I broke myself. I am back. In the end of the, at the end of the day, development is more continuous in that also kids might be a little bit more competent at certain stages than Piaget tended to like tended to assume. I mean, when you think about it, Piaget is asking, you know, two and three, four, five, six-year-olds to explain their own cognitive experience. And so it's limited to what they can self-report. They may actually have different skills or have more nuanced stages of development, but they just weren't able to articulate it at the time. Never mind. also, then this is a huge issue with a lot of this when it comes to development. These are heavily culturally biased. So... Again, when we think about, much like with psychoanalytics and Freud, um, it's true in general of psychology. In a lot of these, these fundamental studies, I mean, Piaget was conducting studies on children in Europe at a particular junction in time. So the observations then are bounded by time and by culture. In fact, a lot of these very, fund what we consider to be, or considered, past tense, to be very fundamental elements of development just are not real in other cultures. They maybe follow completely through different trajectories, and that's an entirely new field or developing field in psychology called cultural comparative psychology. Kind of taking these ideas and saying, all right, well, we've taken a lot of these things for granted for 50 odd years. Do they work outside of America? Do they work outside of Western, uh, Eastern Europe or Western Europe? What if we go to uh, a group of children in India, Australia? Air regions of Africa, China, Japan, Korea, like, like any, any country, really. And do those effects still hold? And it turns out, oftentimes it's not the case. And so when we talk about developmental psychology, I think it's important to point that out because it doesn't come up in a lot of textbooks, but it turns out this is a very active area of conversation. What are the stages of development? How do kids learn and all that? But despite that, Piaget really put forward the scaffolding for how we think about cognitive development. Now, Vygotsky comes in later on and has another focus, in this case, looking at social and cultural influences <coughs> on cognitive development. <coughs> oh no, I've been betrayed by the Sippy. In this case, parents offer a structure for learning and then that scaffolding is generally going to fall away. And this is what we call, if you've ever heard the term, the zone of proximal development. That comes from Vygotsky. Vygotsky has this general idea that we go through stages of development for developing new skills, where when we start off being completely unable to do the thing, we are then able to do the thing with assistance, and then we are able to do the thing on our own. What does it look like when visualized? It looks kind of like this. So when it comes to any skill, Bergotsky would say, you start off totally inept. You cannot do it. You, like, let's say you've never used an oven before. You have no cooking skills whatsoever. And then someone hands you a recipe and says, all right, go bake a cake. Obviously, you're not going to know how to do anything. You don't know what flour is. You don't know how to measure things. You don't know how the oven works. And so you simply cannot do it. But then maybe you learn what some of those more foundational skills. You learn how to use an oven. You learn how to measure flour and all the other ingredients. And then you can do it with assistance. And then gradually, you can do it without assistance. And this is the scaffolding concept here. So if you, again, you've probably heard the idiom that when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. It's basically how the zone of proximal development works. It's not even, it's like there are certain things sometimes where you are just not going to be able to do it, no matter how hard you try, 
until you develop certain foundational skills and then a person might be able to teach you and then you can develop the ability to do that later on. So what are some more contemporary theories? Well, we have a whole host of them. There's general cognitive theories that focus on how we acquire knowledge, sociocultural that focus on interaction and social context, and modular accounts that focus on how we learn specific skills. We talked about some of these, especially with language and how people develop language skills and might become bilingual or multilingual later on like based on certain factors. So there's like a whole host of stuff in developmental psych. And when I said early on that developmental psych is just literally anything in psychology plus time, that's just what it is. It's anything that you can imagine over time falls under the purview of developmental psychology, and so language over time, skill acquisition over time, social skills over time, all of those have different theories. Oh my god, that's actually very funny. The, the Piaget theory, the, the Piagetto theory. <laughs> oh, I'm being, once it, my own childhood comes back to haunt me. Okay. <laughs> so what are some cognitive landmarks? Well, aside from the ones that we have previously discussed, naive physics, in other words, understanding how things interact. Remember when we talked about, like, I think this even came up in chat. If you ask a child, if you drop a pound of feathers or a pound of steel, which is going to fall faster? It's naive physics. It's like a child being able to develop experience with the world and to be able to hypothetically imagine situations and then navigate through them and how things would physically interact. That's a skill that we develop over time. We also develop things like a concept of self and a theory of mind. Let's see, where is the... Let me jump over once again to YouTube. I've been using more of this. Welcome to my YouTube for recommendations, including Endwalker. All right, here we go. The false belief task. Let me make sure closed captions are on. And uh, here we go. Here we go. Let's watch kids be silly. We're going to have a tea party with Play-Doh. I'm going to show myself. Here's Sarah. No! Well, you've probably discovered that however smart your three-year-old is, she doesn't seem able to put herself in someone else's mental shoes to imagine how they think and what they believe. Perhaps you thought your parenting skills were to blame, but scientists suggest that understanding other minds is a skill that may not be fully developed until a child is about four. To learn how children's social skills evolve between about three and four, researchers use something called a false belief test. Ah, what Santa. What do you think in this box? Looks fairly obvious, doesn't it? Crayons. But let me show you. I filled it full of candles. <gasps> All right, now I close it up again. Oh no, it's my birthday. While you and I have been having this conversation, Snoopy has been down here asleep. Doesn't know what we've talked about. But let's bring him into the conversation. Now I have another question for you. What do you think Snoopy will say if I ask him what's in this box? Crayons, obviously. <laughs> what else could anybody possibly say? He's so serious in how he well, talks about this. Watch this three-year-old. <laughs> inside this box. Okay, let's open it up and see. Oh! Candles. Now, you can ask the child what appears to be a very simple question about that. What did you think was inside the box <laughs> when you first saw it? They say, oh, I always thought that there were candles in this box. Then you can ask them about someone else. So you can ask them about Snoopy. Snoopy's been sitting here. He hasn't seen this box. He's never seen us open it up. What does Snoopy think is inside this box? Uh, candles. He can say the same thing. Snoopy will think there are candles inside this box. And what that indicates is that the children's view of how minds work is very, very different from the view that you and I would have. I mean, obviously Snoopy will think there are candles. Snoopy is the very smart. In the three-year-old, everyone sees the world much the same way. There's no difference between what I think and believe and what everyone else, including Snoopy, thinks and believes. It is, in a sense, a naive and innocent view of the world, a kind of mental Eden. If only we can and go then, back. about four, comes the fall from grace. No! 
Now, How do we get back? Four-year-old, quite typically, the four-year-old will tell you that, as a matter of fact, he thought there were crayons in the box, and then he found out that there were candles in the box. You can ask him about Snoopy, and he'll say, oh, no, Snoopy will think that there are crayons in this box. Great. Why will he think that? Because it's a crayon box. Mm -hmm. Shame my life's been going downhill since the age of four. Yeah, what's really in the box? Candles. And then you get the five-year-olds who are just utterly blasé and think that this is such an obvious thing, it's silly even to ask the question. What that shows is that by the time children are four and five, they have a view of the mind that looks much more like our view of the mind. They understand that things can be tricky and deceptive, that you can change your mind, that things aren't always the way that they seem. And that gives them a very different vision of how the mind works and how people work. It's Plato's cave, but it's just showing Snoopy candles. I need that. And then it's my turn. Children who pass the false belief test now understand that other people can have different beliefs, even mistaken beliefs. Some scientists suggest that this test is further evidence of innate brain circuits specialized for reading other people's minds. They call it a theory of mind mechanism. How inventive. A theory of mind. Theory of mind mechanism. I want to go back to highlight one thing. Conversation. This really is the face of a guy who got into this to dunk on children. <laughs> look at this guy. He's like, look, just look at these absolute fools. Look at these children. They think that there's crayons in the crayon box. Can you imagine? Can you imagine that the child would think that there's crayons in the crayon box? <laughs> oh, that's great. You know, I mean, I really am genuinely of the mind. <laughs> Some people do get into psychology because they like goofing on people. We're basically professional pranksters. Like, look at me embarrass these children on national television. Look how great I am. <laughs> so interestingly, though, and kind of pulling it back, I think uh, I just came up, I think Tom said it in chat. Yeah. It's like the idea of empathy, the idea to under the, the ability to understand that other people under like see the world differently than we do is not an inherent thing that people just have. They have to learn it. And it's a thing that we genuinely build up over time. You know, again, like you ask a three year old, what, what, do, what do you think that I think about this? And they will tell you exactly what they think. You might say, hey, how do you, uh, I, you don't like Brussels sprouts. Do so you think I like Brussels sprouts? And they'll say, no, obviously. I, how could anyone possibly like Brussels sprouts? I dislike them. And then it'll say, hey, I like, uh, you like Minecraft. Do you think I like Minecraft? And they'll say, yes, you obviously love Minecraft. You fool, you're a VTuber. And I'll say, aha, you got me there. <laughs> so the thing we have to build up over time, counting and math, and like in the ability to, again, you were thinking about in Piaget's model, about this whole idea of hypotheticals and abstracts and everything. Well, counting and math, number lines, are about as hypothetical as things get. So the ability to understand that 2 plus 2 equals 4. And it's like these are all hypothetical concepts that it takes time for us to be able to figure out. All right. Social development. So we're coming, we're rounding into the end of here. So any other questions like before we get into social constructs about mental development and, me and mental mechanisms and all that? I still can't believe that that crayon, like that crayon unboxing was definitely like, so given the time frame, what if one of those kids went on to become the, the, an unboxing YouTuber? I mean, it wouldn't shock me, right? Unanticipated consequences of psychological research. This kid just got really into unboxing. He said to keep opening stuff up and open up all the crayons to make sure there weren't candles inside. And then they started recording it and they started sharing it with people. And so we got unboxing YouTube. All right, let's move on then. So shortly after birth, we people tend to develop an interest in other people. This is the start of social development, as it were. About in about eight to nine months and peaking at about 12 to 15 months, we start to develop stranger anxiety. So initially, infants are very interested in basically everyone all the time. And then over the course of experience, 
start to develop preference for familiar faces and start to develop anxiety around strangers. And even then, as time goes on, children, very, even very young children, will start to develop temperament. Like showing largely a genetic influence, it's like according to some studies, showing that there is a difference in social and emotional styles that tend to emerge early on. About 40% of babies are, would be considered easy, 10 are difficult, 15% are slow to warm up, and about 10% might show some level of something that is, would be considered behaviorally inhibited or very withdrawn, even. And this translates to attachment and how we develop emotional bonds with other people. So there is a couple of fun ideas here. Uh, I actually need to go bring this one up on my own here. But in some models, researchers believe that there are certain windows where we are more sensitive to relationship formation. And that is not necessarily just unique to people. So Lorenz decided to uh, have a fun experiment. By fun, I mean hilarious and inspired the movie fly away home it's like looking at goslings so what lorenz wanted to do oh this is a fun let's just watch the whole video it's very fun lorenz wanted to see what would happen if a group of goslings saw him as their first sight after being born so they come into the world and this is who they see Conrad Lorenz. Doing Conrad Lorenz stuff. Silent movie style. Yelling at nature as one does. Look at all those chickens. He's summoning the flock like a psychological druid, calling the birds with a megaphone. <laughs> Nature's had it too good for nature has had it good too good for too long. I need to stop this. But look at this. So again, Conrad Lorenz made it so that these goslings saw him first as they were born, and they imprinted onto him as if he was their mother. And so these sea cats now just hung out with him forever. And it's adorable. Let's be real. Who wouldn't want this? Who wouldn't want a bunch of geese that hang out with you? You just go kayaking with your geese friends. Like... Look at the babies. And then later on, you get to like jog out and yell and have your, your flock of geese fly in to attack your enemies. It's the dream of everyone, really. Yeah, imagine not having to fear the geese. Imagine just having geese hang out and be chill. Who doesn't want geese friends? So it's very obvious with the geese, right? But psychological theorists actually believe that there, this might be more applicable then we realize and that actually there might be something to imprinting when it comes on and goes on. So eventually, in the case of Conrad Lorenz, like, like geese that do leave their parents, they did eventually start to migrate and leave. But especially during their early, their infancy, they just kind of hung out and followed him around and everything. And then later on went out and did, the, did other geese things. But they did imprint on him. Like based on that exposure. So half of the eggs were near him, half were near the mother goose. After hatching, the ones that saw him first followed him, as if he was their mother. So what about contact and comfort? So it was initially assumed that children bonded with, the, with those that provided nourishment. So Harry Harlow decided, what if I could separate physical comfort and nourishment? Isn't that great? You know, you just like, what, what if I just like, what if I made a dichotomy that does not exist in nature to see what could happen? Well, Harry Harlow decided that that would be fun to do when we get the seminal work of Harlow and his monkeys. In these studies, Harlow took these Reese's monkeys, separated them in infancy from their parents. Again, like the early psychological studies, especially stuff like Harlow's monkeys, honestly, I look at and think would probably never be done. 
it's like by a modern i don't think any modern irb would ever let this study happen because it is fairly cruel but it did give us some interesting insight into how we develop social bonds in this case the monkeys were given two mothers one is the terry cloth mother on the right it has a light bulb inside of it so it's warm it has a ticking clock in some trials where it sort of has a simulated heartbeat it's warm it has a face that looks kind of like a monkey it's made it's covered in cloth and the other one is just a wire cage with a bottle of milk in it so harlow decided to make a dichotomy between physical comfort and nourishment and what we found over time again initially people thought you just get attached to wherever food comes from but that's not the case the monkeys formed much closer bonds to the warm comforting mother than to the cold mechanical mother even though it was the one where they were getting food in some cases if they were next to each other like this the monkeys would stay clinging to the cloth mother and then reach over and bend to get food because well who wouldn't i mean look i'm a <clears throat> 24 year old woman and look my my house is covered in plushies there's not a single sofa that does not have a plushie on it they're like my bed is covered in them so look i relate but how does this relate to attachment styles again so we've talked about critical junctions of development so it turns out that over time different people develop different reactions to being separated from their primary caregiver we explore this with the stranger situation wherein a child once again some of these really really pass for cruelty is separated from their mother be translated into a standard laboratory setting for controlled scientific study after conducting extensive observations of parents and children at home a student of bowlby's mary ainsworth devised such a procedure called the strange situation which places the child under some stress it has become the most widely used standardized way to assess the quality of a child's attachment to their caregiver you ever notice how all the people that do these studies are british here the researchers are recording how 14 month old lisa responds in this attractive but unfamiliar setting how will she react to a stranger what will happen when her mother leaves the room and when she returns It's Lisa's behavior when her mother returns, what psychologists call the reunion, that they are particularly interested in. The most importantly is to look for the type of balance that a child strikes between an attachment need and on the other hand to explore the play material. Look at that plushy dog. That seems like a friend right Once there. Once Lisa has settled down to play, a stranger enters the room and sits in the chair reading a magazine. After a couple of minutes, the stranger attempts to interact with Lisa. Soon after, Lisbeth gets a cue to leave the room. The stranger tries to comfort Lisa, but in vain. Lisbeth comes back into the room, and the camera records how Lisa reacts. Now the first part of the procedure is over, and Lisbeth settles Lisa down again. The stranger leaves them alone together. This is so malicious. They have the, like the secret camera room and everything too. Ugh. And soon after, Lisbeth goes too. Lisa is on her own. Her distress is plain to see. This poor child. Once again, the efforts of the stranger to console Lisa are to no avail. Lisa. 
son crying but babies hurts manages me. manages to calm her almost at once. And shortly afterwards, the observation ends. Lisa showed outward signs of what's called secure attachment. Now, one, one thing I noticed here that I've, I've never seen before while watching this video. So, Lisa. The stranger has really good boots. Where'd she get these? Like, those are really cute boots. I'd wear those. <laughs> those are freaking cute. Them some good boots. All right. So, attachment styles, what does it actually mean? So, we talked about secure attachment there. In the strange situation task, again, the child sits down with their primary caregiver, they play for a little bit, and then usually the parent leaves, a stranger comes in, and people see how the child reacts. And so this breaks down into basically four different categories in the traditional model. About 60% of kids do what you saw there. They show secure attachment, which is the adult leaves, they notice the adult, the mother or the caregiver has left, and they are uncomfortable because of it. Now, insecure avoidant attachment, they're basically indifferent, indifferent but insecure anxious attachment is where the child is, notices that the parent is gone and starts to freak out. They won't play with the toys when the mother leaves, and then they don't really know how to act when the mother comes back. So whereas the secure child notices the, ch the mother leaves, gets upset, and then calms down when they return, the insecure anxious attachment style is characterized by freaking out when the mother leaves, but then not really having that consistent calming down as easily when they, when they return. And in a rare case, there is another style, disorganized attachment. It is rare. It barely ever, it doesn't really come up all that much, but it's inconsistent. It basically is sort of the lump category for a child that doesn't fall into these other points where they might seem dazed or just confused. They really don't know what's going on. In other words, they don't seem to really have a strong or a stable style of attachment to their primary caregiver. Now, again, there is an enormous amount of cultural difference here and a lack of reliability on the strange situation task. It turns out that kids tend to change their styles over very brief periods of time. So a child who is tested and then shows a secure attachment style tested two or three weeks later might show an insecure style and vice versa. Kids develop very rapidly and so it's hard to really, again, sort people into these hard categories. But in general, the idea of an attachment style is a good concept. I don't know if this paradigm is really a great one because it's, it doesn't have a lot of care, it did a lot of nuance or room for ex expansion later on in life. But there's a little bit of something, something going on there. So also notably, there is a difference between how people tend to primary and secondary care, how children form attachment to primary and secondary caregivers. So parenting styles now, moving on from attachment. Generally, the research tends to fall into four different categories. You've got permissive parents, authoritarian parents, authoritative parents and uninvolved parents. Permissive parents kind of let everything fly. Authoritarian parents are very strict. Authoritative parents are supportive but set firm limits. And uninvolved parents that are neglectful or ignoring. Interestingly enough, though, you would probably think that, you know, obviously, you know, it's the permissive or the authoritative parents are probably better at raising kids, right? One of these has to be better. But that doesn't seem to be the case. Overall, when it comes to a child's development, it seems to be more that it's about consistency in style, more so than the specifics of the style. Now, there might be some cases where certain children might have a propensity towards impulsivity or violent behavior. In those cases, there might be a preferred style. But for the vast majority of kids, what's more important is that there is a consistent expectation in their environment that allows them to anticipate what is going to happen. 
it's having disruptions in the home environment and how they're relating to and how the other people relate to them that can cause things to get more complicated, more so than having any one style in particular. So what, so let's just get into a couple quick, quick shots here. Um, what about single parent homes? It's inconclusive. There's no clear relationship between whether or not a child is raised by a single parent and their developmental outcomes. What about same sex parents? No difference whatsoever. It could, study after study after study comes back saying that children that are raised by same sex couples do not differ from children raised by opposite sex couples in social adjustment, academics, or even social, uh, sexual orientation. So kids raised by gay parents are not more likely to become gay. It doesn't happen. And provided that they have the same basic needs met, yeah, there's no difference in social outcomes overall. So yeah, uh, am I saying that the psychology is proving the instability of poverty is incredibly bad for kids? Yes. Yeah, it's, I mean, even beyond, I mean, parenting styles and everything, if we're talking about this as saying, like, uh, one of the major points for childhood development is stability. Poverty is a tremendous detriment to kids in their development. It's not even just about nutrition. It's not about, you know, meal instability or food instability. It has a real psychological impact on people. And it's not even just as a child. Even as we talk about into adulthood and later adulthood, Having experienced poverty at any point, it has a tremendous lasting impact on people. Like once you experience that kind of scarcity and that kind of instability, it does stick with you. And it especially can stick with kids as they then can carry that with them for through the rest of their life course. Now, when it comes to divorce, most children don't have long-term emotional difficulties resulting from divorce. A lot of it comes down to the severity of the divorce. Higher, like the less conflict there is, the better the outcome in general. So the opposite of what my slide says. But yeah, so in general, again, it, the core idea here is that it's not really about any specific thing. It's like it's more about a having a consistent environment and making sure that their basic needs are met is what's going to propel children having their a more a more stable developmental course. All right, oops, I hacked up that slide. Let me uh, let me go fix that real quick. Let's let's go add that, add that animation. Whoop! All right, forget you saw that. That's the real teaching experience. Whereas it's not a real lecture unless you screw up at least one animation on one slide. All right. So uh, when we're talking about gender identity, I'm going to talk more about this in another lecture. So I'm just going to touch on this now. In general. Thankfully, people are figuring out that sex and gender are very different. And that there is a discrepancy, like, whereas sex is something that is usually biologically assigned at birth and even more nuanced than most people give credit to. It's not simply an M or an F. And it's like, and gender is the psychological characteristics that we ascribe to how people perceive themselves as being on a spectrum of identity. And so we have sort of discrete roles that do exist, but that is, again, still different than gender as we have come to understand it. Now, I don't love these. I think that every version of the genderbred man is whack for different reasons. Unfortunately, this is the best one that I was able to find. I'm going to have to make one of my own. But ultimately, this is a more nuanced understanding of gender that we've kind of come to as as researchers. Like I've used this before when I've given diversity talks. I just I'll be honest, I hate, I hate, I hate that there's always like a DNA thing or something on the thing's crotch. It happens in literally all of them, and I don't know why people keep doing this. But anyway. Here we break down gender into things such as internal perceptions of identity, outward expression. Physical attraction, emotional attraction, and also sex assigned at birth. And yes, according to all of these infographics, the DNA is stored in the balls. Gonna, just gonna move on. Gonna move on. So how do we develop our sense of identity? Well, there's a couple of different 
perspectives on this, as with anything. I mean, over time, we develop a, a sense of, of who we are. Yeah. Do they have a, you know, like, a, <laughs> making the double helix with your hands? <laughs> uh, all right. So how do we develop identity or a sense of who we are? Erickson has a model of identity development that proposes eight stages. As you can probably tell, there's already a problem with anything that proposes stages as discrete categories of development, but it's an interesting idea. So Erickson breaks out this idea that we go through stages of infancy to toddlerhood to early childhood to middle childhood to adolescence to young adulthood to adulthood and to aging. And that every one of these stages, we have a core conflict we have to resolve. As children, we develop tr uh, feelings of our ability to trust versus mistrust. As early child children, we deserve initiative versus guilt. As adolescents, we struggle with our sense of identity versus the roles we are asked to play, and so on and so forth. And how we resolve these, these conflicts are going to play a role in our identity, but it's a cool idea. It seems neat. It's basically what someone it, it would come up with on Reddit in, in modern times. It's, there's very little empirical support for it. It's just cool. And it has kind of a funny infographic, so I'm showing it. Yeah, unfortunately, Erickson failed to consider the immortality of, of transhumanist VTubing, and so we haven't gotten that far in the model. <laughs> you can't class up as a young adult until you max out confusion. <laughs> Let's see. So uh, catching up here, what did we come up with on Reddit? Uh, we came up with the idea of, yeah, basically identity Freud Freudianism. Yeah. So Kohlberg comes up with a theory of moral development. And then it's, again, this is how do we develop, again, some more social skills. And use moral problems to identify the underlying principles that people use to solve them. So as Piaget and other people talked about in the preceding models, we really wanted to get into this idea of skills and junctions that people reached and how those marked their development. Holberg thought of, well, what if instead of using stuff like conservation tasks, we used moral reasoning? And so Kohlberg points out three stages of moral reasoning, the pre-conventional, conventional, and post-conventional stages. Early on, we are rule followers. Then we start to understand societal values so that something, just because something is legal, does not mean that it is necessarily correct. And then we move on to things like abstract moral reasoning. So the Heinz dilemma, I'm just going to read to you. So Heinz has a wife. Heinz's wife is dying from a particular type of cancer. Doctors say that a new drug might save her, but the drug is very expensive, and the local chemist who makes it is charging 10 times the money that it costs to make. However, Heinz has a plan. After being unable to raise, raise the full amount, Heinz was only able to raise half of which. After asking friends and family, and after explaining to the wife, or to the chemist that his wife is dying and that in asked the chemist to sell the drug for cheaper, the chemist refuses. So Heinz takes it on himself to break into the chemist's laboratory and steal the drug. It's shocking to me now that I'm reading this, how this is just the American healthcare system. So Kohlberg might have just, oh God, the problem is capitalism once again. So Kohlberg would then say, all right, well, is the problem capitalism, yes or no? And then why is the problem capitalism? So some people are going to criticize this and say it correctly. There is cultural bias. There tends to be, in some cases, a like some would say that's a sexual bias. I don't think that's necessarily true. It's a gender role thing. But basically, there is also a low correlation with moral behavior and assumes that moral reasoning precedes emotional reaction to moral issues. But ideally, the way someone would work through this is that in the pre-conventional stage, they would say, Heinz broke the law. He sh his wife should just die and he should go to jail. Then later on, at the conventional stage, they might say, well, this is like our societal values are based around fairness, 
it's unfair of the chemist to be gouging the price of this drug, and so Heinz is in the right. In a post-conventional stage, they might focus on more moral principles about an existential idea of right and wrong, or the fact that the real villain here is capitalism, and in fact, no one is right and no one is wrong, and we are all just puppets dancing on the string of exploited labor. But that's just me. <laughs> 57 on the Heinz bottle represents half the cost that Heinz was able to raise among his friends and family. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, we can never escape that the real problem is capitalism. So, all right, let's, we're wrapping up here. So what does adulthood look like? We've talked about childhood, prenatal development, adolescence. We've covered basically the entirety of life within the last 90 minutes. What does adulthood look like? Well, between the ages of 18 to 40, most people change jobs about 10 and a half times. I imagine this number is actually higher now. And when we talk about the course of adulthood, we talk a lot about stuff like developments about love and commitment and how those changes, those styles are going to change over time and how parenthood is also usually like the seminal event of adulthood in most developmental models, followed by maybe a midlife crisis or empty nesting syndrome. And in later adulthood, we get into stuff like um, maybe the fact that chronological age is not a good measure. When we, as we get on, it's very useful. It's like IQ, it's useful for younger children, but as we get into older courses of life cycle, in the life cycle, it's not as practical or as useful anymore. And so we start to think about later adulthood as being maybe something that we should be breaking out into things like biological, psychological age, functional age, our social age. How do we act? How do we dress? How do we function? How do we think? How, are our, how is our physical body working? And then as we can, when you look at it, you know, there are 50 year olds that feel younger than than 40 year olds that I know there. Are, I know 60 year olds that have maybe the sense of style and dress of someone a third of their age. Look, life is very long. It's a very winding road. And as we get further on and we get into sort of adulthood and later adulthood, age becomes Less of a factor. It's not quite, it becomes really a number. And so developmental psychologists have tried to think of different ways to define age as people get older to chart later life trajectories. I guess that's a good takeaway here. Like once we get after our teens, age does kind of become just a number. And that's what I got for this week. So next time we're going to talk about motivation and emotion. I'm going to go hang out for a little bit here in, uh, in office hours, but thanks again for, for hanging out. This is always a lot of fun for me. We're coming up on the end of this series, though. I think this was the 11th of 16. So probably early next year, we'll be wrapping this up. It's going to be um, really fun. Or is it? It's going to be a big accomplishment to wrap this up and to have actually done this because again these are my actual lecture slides from when i was a professor so this is this basically is an intro psychology course that i i've managed to put up on the internet via vtubing it's one of the things i'm the most proud of so we'll have to see what i'll do afterwards and i do have one idea that i'm going to talk about in office hours here so uh if you'll follow me over why don't we uh Get started on that. Anyway, in the meantime, take care.